Welcome back to the My Latin Life podcast. Since 2014, My Latin Life has been your trusted guide to traveling and living in Latin America. Today, Mr. O Tide Passport, his first podcast appearance. Mr. Passport, how are you? I'm doing good, doing good. Thanks for having me. Thanks for having me. How's everything going on your end? It's good, man. I have to imagine that you're probably one of the most requested podcast guests. So I'm very happy that we got you to Voice Docs and let everyone hear that suave Southern accent of yours. Well, I'm glad to be on. I didn't know I was requested, but I'll take the compliments. Oh, come on. You knew. You knew you were in demand. I am simply a, an internet troll that occasionally says good things. That's all. <laughs> and we did uh, put the question to people a little bit. You know, what do they want to hear from this episode? We, we asked on Twitter. We asked in the Telegram groups. You know, what would people be most interested? So we're going to dive into everyone's questions here on the podcast. But I thought, um, you know, before we jump into the to the fan questions, maybe just catch us up on how things have been. You've been in Mexico City for how long now? It's uh, almost three years, just under three years now. I showed up right at the uh, well, kind of like midway through the pandemic wasn't planned or anything. I actually just had a bunch of friends that were living here. I lived in a, a bunch of countries beforehand and people slowly started, ended up in Mexico City. So I said, hey, I'll take a little vacation. Came down, planned to stay for two weeks. And within the first month I said, I'm all in. I went back home for three weeks, started the residency process, came back and I never left. And do you still love it as much as ever in Mexico City? You're starting to get bored or to thriving more than ever? No, it's only gotten better. I'd say it's like as you stay longer, instead of being the digital nomad type area where you're just bouncing around every couple of weeks, you know, not really getting to know people, staying long term just ends up with a whole lot more like social circle aspects, business aspects. You meet a lot of people. And of course, you know, the, the plug is like as you learn Spanish, you get to interact with more and more people that are actually doing more things versus going to the bars and just drinking at tourist bars and whatnot. Mm -hmm. And so now that you're hanging out a little bit more with Mexicans and building a local, local social, ah, local social circle, as opposed to just all digital nomads, what kind of people are you meeting in Mexico? Like if you had to describe maybe a couple of archetypes, or generalities of the people that you're seeing there? Uh, I'd actually say like partially as a joke, but not as a joke, the the Fresa class, like more of the upper middle to, to rich class of people where, I mean, the typical places I'm going to go is like maybe I'll occasionally go to a golf course or, or like even an indoor golf range and you're going to meet people there. And like anybody that is golfing in Mexico, the prices are pretty much the same as America, so they likely have – uh, money. Let's say, you know, if you're hanging out in the Polanco area and stuff like that, or like even the Lomas area, you're just going to meet people that are typically in some sort of uh, like business. A lot of them are entrepreneurship type people. Um, even if they're in corporate, like that's still a lot of decent connections to meet a whole lot of different personalities. Like you meet a guy that's got, you know, a business that operates partially in America and he introduces you to contacts. Or with the startup area, like I'd say Mexico City has a massive startup segment um, where like both AWS, Google is here. You could say like the Santa Fe area has got a lot of uh, like business and, and tech area stuff going on there. Kind of unknown but known areas that like uh, Mexico has got, what is it, 60% of the people are unbanked. So there's a big push for startups where there's a lot of fintech startups that are either running in Mexico or trying to run in Mexico. So occasionally you just meet a lot of contacts like that. And do, you end do up- Do you ever actually go out to Santa Fe and Lomas and stuff, or they just come to you? Typically people actually just come this area. I mean, people people live in the Lomas, <laughs> people live in Santa Fe, but like nobody's really going out there to hang out. Like I've got some friends that live there and, you know, it Have sucks that they've like got to take a- the club there or hang out restaurants out there, like strategically- 
to be around that, like go to the mall out there and stuff? Or do you just find that where you're at in Mexico City, um, you're just kind of getting a lot of flow of people from those areas? I'd say like not intentionally. I've just, I've met the people within the areas that I live in and hang out with, and they'll invite me to those areas, but I'm not going to strategically go there just to see if I can like meet new people. If I'm going to strategically go somewhere, I'm going to like a soccer field or the park where people are playing, you know, <laughs> soccer or something like that just to so hang out. You you don't play golf, do you, right? You just like go, I absolutely you... suck at golf. I okay. I, I can play. I can play, but if it's like a, I've been to a tournament, I'm like, yo, don't don't pair with me for this tournament. Like, I'm fine just watching you guys because you don't want you don't want to see what I'm going to do. Hmm. I'm so great at some top of the golf, things, though. Good at top golf. So some of the things on Twitter that you're most known for is talking about Mexico and Mexico City in general sales and online tech sales, um, social circle game, um, how to throw a party, uh, partying, um, things like that. Basically the, I guess, nightlife or social aspect of being an expat. Um, what, what else are you most known for or people find that you, they're reaching out to you the most for? Um, I'd say probably kind of similar to, to your aspect where there's a lot of people that are interested in going to Mexico, Latin America. Maybe they've visited before, but they have no idea like how to do more than a, a short term vacation. So they typically reach out saying like, hey, I'm interested. I've been to X, Y, Z, but I don't know, like, how am I going to make friends? How am I going to, uh, you know, find an apartment? How am I going to do things that doesn't require Airbnb? Um, and then the other section is more of like the dating section, which isn't Latin America focus. That was more that I got a lot of questions about it. I happened to have a lot of knowledge on it. So I decided to write about it and it became a kind of bigger area that I also will talk about. Hmm. And so what do you say to the people looking to relocate to Mexico City I mean, do you just kind of say, come on down, or do you have like a whole structure to it? So first thing that I'll say is, uh, I've said this in posts before, tweets before, is that like Mexico City is not a place to come if you're trying to conserve money or if you're trying to find like the cheapest lifestyle possible. Like Mexico City is the capital. So you're dealing with not only people from all around the country trying to find jobs, but lots of businesses going here. And then you can also put in, you know, like Mexico City and Monterrey being the like most expensive, most or like uh, cities with where the most rich people are. So it's not a place where like, hey, I want to survive on six hundred dollars a month. I want to go to Mexico City. It's more of like, hey, I'm already doing well where I am now, but I want to go somewhere else. I want to, you know, enjoy better sun, you know, slightly cheaper food, a completely different lifestyle where you're able to live, say, you know, a uh, quote, millionaire's lifestyle without spending the millionaire dollars. I mean, like my background is coming from, you know, Washington, D.C., New York City areas where those areas are already extremely expensive. So if you have the money to survive in those areas, you'll do fine. But if you're coming from uh, like a much smaller salary or, you know, income, Mexico City might be a whole lot harder, especially when you're not only competing with foreigners, but you're competing with the you know, well-off people that live in the city and their kids that want to live that same, you know, city lifestyle. Hmm. Definitely makes sense. So let's talk about prices. Like, do you still think, do you think that Mexico City is cheaper than, say, a Washington, D.C.? Or is it kind of close to the same pricing? Or It's way, way cheaper in that area. Like, let's say, I, I also say I could be a bad example because... Again, I'm I'm not necessarily living a cheaper lifestyle. I paid twenty five hundred dollars a month for a one bedroom in the D.C. area. I had one bedroom there. Now in Mexico City, I'm paying thirty one thousand pesos, which probably is like around seventeen hundred. But now I have three bedrooms and two thousand square feet. So I mean, I'm I I don't know what a, a one bedroom would cost. Um, I'm not really concerned with that. I, I don't live with other people. I live by myself. I just enjoy the space. 
So that's probably the price for, you know, housing. I'd say you probably could get away with a thousand dollars a month if you're doing, you know, a one bedroom. If you wanted to live in, say, you know, the Roma, uh, Condesa, Polanco area, something like that. In okay. terms of like going out, just having fun. I mean, if you're coming, you know, as a tourist, you're probably interacting with a lot of the tourist stuff. So things are going to be inflated. After you live here long enough, you start figuring out where the locals go to or even like the upper class locals go to. And the price is kind of level off where I'd say I probably spend maybe $3,000 a month. Maybe a little more with the exchange rate being so bad, but that's still living, uh, I'd say, like pretty much upper middle class life where I'd Sorry, just be you, spending. You, spay, you spend three k a month, including rent? Including rent, yeah. Okay, so doing the math here, so you're only spending like twelve, thirteen hundred bucks on everything else? Yeah. Regular okay. life it's is extremely bad. cheap in that aspect where, I mean, I also would say now I barely drink. Like even when we met up, like you drank most of the uh, the bottle that we had. Like surprisingly, I, I rarely drink, so a lot of my money does not go to alcohol, whereas most people's does. So that's probably keeping my expenses low, also. Speaking of drinks, uh, we can totally hear that bottle cap flipping around, whatever, whatever you're fiddling with. Just saying, uh, <laughs> it's water. My bad. My bad. Street water. But yeah, I guess worth mentioning. We we have hung out. Uh, a number of times in Mexico City, so not our not our first time talking. So maybe the audience cares, doesn't care, but yeah, we have met in person, and I've seen Bowtie Passport um, do it for real. I've been to a party or two of his, and kind of seen a little bit of the social circle, and um, you know what you're doing. I, I think one of my favorite lines from one of your Substack articles, where. And I had never heard of this, this piece of advice before, but you said, get like a huge amount of toilet paper and <laughs> estimate like one roll of toilet paper per girl, which is hilarious, girls, yeah. but also like quite true. If there's no toilet paper anymore, like the girls are going to have to go home, right? So that could be a party ender. And you, it's like something you don't even think about. Yeah, that I mean, that comes from, you know, further in the background is like I was an army officer. So I spent six years as an army logistics officer at a point you hit captain and you're kind of managing a whole lot more of battalion level, which could be, you know, five to seven thousand people at any given time. And we went through a lot of toilet paper, (laughs) like dealing with soldiers. So it's one thing that kind of stuck with me is like once you start getting groups and groups of people together, it's hilarious that you have no idea how many times people take a shit. Well, they're, they're doing something else with that toilet paper in the back. That also. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that was a good one, though. Um, you know, so many directions we could we could go with this episode, but maybe it would be a fun one to tell us kind of how you um, how you plan a party. Uh, I know I know you've been through it a little bit on Substack, but it's it's a fun one if you want to roll through kind of because you do have a lot of well developed strategies in terms of you know I think you create a banner with Canva to make it seem more legit. Maybe you make it a theme event. Um, you know you're you're constantly reminding people like the day of and stuff like that. Um, tell us a little bit about how you are throwing parties in a foreign country? I guess we'll start from the the beginning is, you know, after you've met enough people, after you've built a solid social circle up, I typically find a couple of solid guys, like guys that aren't going to just completely fuck it up for everybody else. Like not a guy that's going to show up to the party and try to hit on every girl, like a dude that's a solid friend that's just reliable, but also knows people. And that's where you start inviting tons of people on. Like it's it's Latin America. So people are going to say yes because they're just going to say yes and they're not going to show up. So, I mean, you might throw on 50 people on the list to get 20, 25 people to show up. From there, it's it's a matter of I, I like to break everything up into like sections. Hey, one of my friends, you're going to do all the alcohol. Another friend, you know, you supply food, snacks, plates and everything like that. You know, maybe... If it's a, a bigger event, like one of my friends, you handle getting the DJ together. 
and split all the work between a couple of people. That way, you know, you're not stressing on everything yourself. Um, I do say I, I use like Canva or anything to create like a little ad advertisement. It doesn't really, uh, it's not necessary, but it makes people think they're like, okay, this is like an actual party, not just a, a little hangout where we're going to stand around and drink beer or something like that. Um, I said one of the, one of the things that's most controversial is, yeah, I'll send the invite first on, you know, two weeks out and then maybe four days before the event, I'll confirm people. But that time also gives me the ability to say like, hey, who are you going to invite? You know, make a list. Here's a you know little sign up sheet so I know who's going to be there. That way I can tell like my my doorman ahead of time because I'm not coming down. To yeah, pick you, you do up. make a sheet with all the names, and then they cross the doorman crosses the name off the list. Yep, yep, and it's it's definitely happened where some people are on the list try to come in, and I'm like, yo, I, you can't just invite random people to my house. Um, but sometimes I'll look at the list, and if there's somebody that wants to invite like five random dudes, I'll conveniently forget to give them the address to the house. That way they just think they're like, oh, he forgot to give it to me. And then they message me back days later. And I'm like, oh, shit, I thought I sent it to you. And that's kind of how I keep random people or as many random people out of my building as possible. But from there, I say like the parties so- typically just work themselves out. I mean, you're probably the intent is to have, you know, way more girls than guys. The girls are going to pick some music they want to listen to and dance around and everything. And you pretty much just let people do what they want to do. My job just becomes, Hey, you know, this is my friend X. I want to introduce you to him and bring more people together and let them talk about whatever. Maybe sometimes people have a, a specific job or like, you know, uh, I actually found that the girl that made the furniture in my house was a friend of another girl I invited. Turned out that she was a, like a furniture maker. And I just kind of contracted her to, make some custom materials for me. Hey guys, quick break from the podcast to tell you about job stacking. If you're a remote or hybrid worker looking to maximize your earning potential, then Rolf Holtza, author of Job Stacking, guarantees you'll be able to double your income by implementing his paycheck multiplication layering method. This is the exact system Rolf has used to take his own income and those of many others beyond 20k a month. With this method, Rolf contractually guarantees that you'll be able to double your income in 45 days. So, if you're interested in unleashing your earning potential and doubling your income, then click the link in the description and book a call with Rolf right now. Hmm. So, two weeks out, four days out, and then day before day of? Day before day of, yep. And then the guides, the guides free, the quote, God is free on my, uh, my gum road and sub stack. There you go. Shout out the sub stack. Okay. I like it. And then the doorman, he's pretty involved. He's got 50 drunk girls, um, bothering him all night. Are you, are you paying him off a little bit? Of course. Of course. That's, that's probably one of the bigger things also is my neighbor has thrown parties every now and then. And she says that the doorman hates her. And I was like, hey, have you have you given him any money? She's like, no. And I'm like, that's why. So every party I'll toss the doorman, you know, 500 pesos, give him the list. That way he's got some structure and it's like just random people. Sometimes I took people like, hey, if you want to give the doorman, you know, 20 pesos or something like that when you come in, that's fine. Also, that keeps him off my back. It keeps the like whatever the like the HOA version of Mexico off my back also because the doorman's not going to snitch on me for having 50 people inside one apartment, but it, it works mm-hmm. itself out. Okay. So 50 people, 500 pesos will do it. That's all he needs. I mean, I don't know how much <laughs> a, a doorman gets paid, but I, I don't imagine they get paid more than, you know, a couple of thousand pesos a month. So an extra 500 seems to go a long way. Yeah. Makes sense. And do they take pictures of the IDs or anything, or they just say like, oh, what's your name? And and that's the end of it. Just what's your name? Yeah. Okay. Okay, cool. Excuse me. Cool. Um, So we'll start walking through some of the questions. I think we got a lot of questions between your tweet, my tweet, and also a couple on Telegram. Um, 
First one from Bowtied Odin, one of your fellow uh, jungle people. Uh, the first things that you learned about when moving to Mexico, what were some of your biggest culture shocks or aha moments? Um, so it's kind of an interesting year where I didn't really have any culture shocks specifically. I'd say, of course, the, the name, moniker, Bowtied Passport should imply that I've lived in a lot of places. So I lived in Germany for a couple of years, Hungary for a couple of years, uh, Korea for a couple of years. So Mexico is a partner, you know, sisters country of the United States. I also lived in Texas. I'm, I'm from Texas. So there's a lot of Hispanics in Texas. It wasn't a big culture shock outside of like people are even more late to things than I would even expect. So coming to, to Mexico, I mean, like I said, I had a couple of friends here. The friends that I had here, actually, one of them uh, owns a relatively like big venue here in Mexico. So right off the bat, I was kind of able to get introduced to a lot of people really relatively quick. So the culture shock really wasn't there. Of like, how do I integrate here? How do you know I meet people? It's like I kind of hit the ground running and, and went from there. Hmm. Yeah, and side note, um, one time I went out with you, we went to a club thing, and you ha you were filming the event, I guess, for the owners. How did, how did that work? You do this occasionally, you get, you get paid in some capacity to film and or promote events? I uh, know, yeah. So that was actually a friend of mine's birthday party, but uh, he owns a modeling agency. So <laughs> I kind of just showed up with my camera and whatnot and i was like y'all do like a, a promo video for your 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 birthday party but i'd also say it's like if any if you ever see me like with the videoing th taking videos of anything i'm never getting paid like it's it's always just friends like i just enjoy well, but like, you were taking videos, that shit taking seriously pictures. i think you were you were filming for like two hours straight you had the What's it called where the phone is on like a dongle? Like a gimbal, thing? yeah, like, like, like gimbal stabilizer. You're taking that I mean, shit I'd, serious. I take bro. I take everything seriously, but like I've I've been offered <laughs> like for actual events to say like, hey, can you like, you know, do some recordings at our events? And I'm kind of like, nah, I just do it for friends. But everything I do, I want to take it like that seriously either way. What made Plus, you buy again, the I gimbal? Don't, I like to. I like to take videos when I travel and whatnot. Or, you know, I've climbed Iztaccíhuatl. I went to, to Monterrey the other week. So I'm just always taking some some good videos. I just don't post everything. Posterity. Iztaccíhuatl. Do you know the story of the two mountains? Um, not exactly. Isn't it like a, like a, a marriage gone wrong or like two jaded lovers or something like that? Where the, like... Iztaccíhuatl and Popocatapetl. Yep, yep. I don't know the exact story, but I know it's, it's along those lines. Yeah, classic uh, Mexican folklore for anyone listening. Uh, look it up on Wikipedia. I couldn't do it justice, but basically it's like one of them was a warrior, and then it was like his wife, and then he went off to war, and he came back, and she. Um, they thought he died at war, and then so she died of anguish and sadness, but then he came back because he actually survived, but she was dead. And then he um, uh, carried her body like up to the top of the mountain. And that's why there's two mountains or something, or that's why the mountain looks like, that's why the mountain looks like the girl. Anyway, something like that. Classic yeah, there's this, mythology. There's probably a story about like the whole like La Huasteca area of like Monterrey and San Luis Potosi also, but I don't, I don't know that one either. Yeah, I think every mountain gets a, gets a story or something. Okay, I'll hit you with another one. Um, danger in Mexico City. How, how safe do you feel? Does it feel safer, more dangerous than Texas, for example? Um, I would say safer. Now, caveat on safety is one... Like, I don't look Mexican enough where people think that I'm Mexican, obviously. <laughs> so any danger, cartels, et cetera, like they're not targeting foreigners. They're also not targeting the average person that's, you know, not involved in any of their game. As long as you're not trying to 
sell drugs or, you know, buy large amounts of drugs or, you know, you don't try to get in some fight with the short dude with the fanny pack at a bar, you're likely never going to see any violence at all. And then I'm... The the <laughs> in front of the bathroom. Yeah, yeah. The, the dude, if you, don't, don't get in a fight with the dude that's selling cocaine in front of the bathroom. It's like 5'4". Uh, he's probably not the guy to, to, to get <laughs> upset. Uh, yeah, just don't mess with people with fanny packs. They have them for a reason. And then even yeah. like driving and stuff like that, I say that, you know, the cartel is no longer dumb. They're not like a ragtag group of, of dudes out in the middle of nowhere. Like some of them are, but the leadership is smart enough to provide their people with technology now. So, I mean, they've got drones and all kinds of stuff. You know, say a couple months ago, I'm driving around up through uh, like Baja Sur and whatnot. The cartel's got drones like, you know, the DJI drones are flying in the air. So if you're in the middle of nowhere, like, it's likely the cartel has, has spotted your car, you know, miles and miles away and already figured out if you're, you know, a random tourist doing some sightseeing or like somebody that could, you know, damage their business where they're, you're, you're not even on their radar. So in terms of safety wise, also, I say like nobody, almost nobody has a gun in Mexico City. It's extremely difficult to get a gun. Like you've got to put in an application, wait a year just to be seen. The only two military or you looked into this, gun right? ranges. Yeah, I, I looked. I mean, I've, I'm not going to say confirm or deny if I have a weapon or not, but it, it takes a long time to get the process for it. And you, you can't figured transport out, them. You figured out the how it works, right? Like you have to go to the military base, all this stuff. Yeah, then they, they just like see you. I mean, even if you do purchase a gun, you can't just leave with it. Like the government essentially has to transport to your house. If you want to transport your gun, you've got to be part of a gun club. There's a lot of loopholes. So I say like, you know, in Texas, everywhere I've got, I've got concealed carry licenses. But in Mexico, I don't feel the need to need a gun because if there ever is an occasion where you would have to use your gun against somebody that probably also has a gun, I just expect that that guy's probably got the pool to have like my whole you know family killed or something like that. Like you're not going to mess with the dude that has a gun. He's probably cartel related. Why would you even bother with that? Nobody else that's you know an average citizen has a gun pretty much. So the safety, like I, I don't feel any danger at all. Plus, I say I'm taller than the average person, so I think people are usually more on edge of me like popping up in the middle of the night somewhere than they are. Like if you see a, a you know six two plus dude pop up at two a.m. on a, like a dark corner, like the average Mexican is more like scared and confused seeing me like pop up out in the middle of nowhere, especially in a random neighborhood, than I should be of them. I'd say. Hmm. Okay. So overall, overall, there's no safety issues. Safety. No safety issues. Cool. Another one from Gabby, global, global Spanish, Portuguese. Speak about obesity and how overweight is now normalized in Latin America. I, I had replied to her and said, I can't answer this question. I have, I have no idea anything about that subject. <laughs> why, why is that? I don't, I don't know that many fat people. No. I, don't, I have a, I have a, uh, you know, a, uh, a blindness where I know that there's a large overweight population, but the area that I live in, I don't really see them and the people that I know aren't fat. So, I mean, I, I eat whatever I want and do minimal time at the gym and I somehow have not gained any weight in the last three years living here. So I, I can't speak on like the obesity problem or any of that stuff. I, I'm not worried about seed oils. That's kind of just a part of life to me. Okay. Speaking of gym, so you have a pretty good gym in Mexico. Is it is it open on Sundays? I don't know if SmartFit's open on Sundays. I'm sure it is. But I've never I when I think about it, I've never been to the gym on Sunday to actually know. But gyms are pretty easy. I mean, if, if you're in Latin America in general, SmartFit's got that Smart Fit Black Pass. It's like five hundred pesos a month. You can go to any gym anywhere and i think they got them in like colombia and stuff also mm -hmm. but if you're in mexico city if you're anywhere near like parque mexico area you can go there and there's going to be people that are doing um like soccer 
boxing lessons. I've had a bunch of friends that do like boxing lessons at Parque Mexico. So in terms of like finding a place to get exercise, despite being in a, a big city, extremely easy. I mean, there's also a ton of parks with the little workout equipment if you really want to do stuff like that. I mean, there's multiple sports complexes. So if you want to, you know, play mm-hmm. soccer, basketball, swim, any of that stuff, easily available, you know, mm-hmm. 500 pesos a month. Mm-hmm. I'm surprised you go to the Smart Fit and not some Equinox type fancy gym. Nah, I'm, I'm fine. I mean, it's also a, a timing thing. Smart Fit for some people is like extremely busy because they go after work or, you know, early in the morning, that's when everybody goes. I mean, I've, I've got nothing to do. So I'll show up at the gym, you know, at 10, 30, 11, or, you know, at two, three, when there's not many people there. That's, that's only when like the, mm-hmm. the housewives and the actual gym dudes go to the gym. So it's never packed anytime I've been. And I mean, I'm, I'm not doing anything wild where I, I need to be like <laughs> at an extra expensive gym. Hey guys, quick break from the episode to tell you about BitRefill. BitRefill allows you to shop online and in person without banks, converting your crypto directly into merchant balance. We're talking gift cards to Nike, Amazon, Apple, Airbnb, Hotels.com, and many more, all paid for with crypto. BitRefill offers more than 10,000 gift card options in 180 countries all across Latin America, including Brazil, Colombia, Mexico, Argentina, El Salvador, and many more. You can also apply the code MYLATINLIFE at checkout to get 10% back on your first purchase. Go to bitrefill.com for more information. Okay, fair enough. Um, <clears throat> so I guess... you. You know, you're kind of alluding to it with the obesity thing, but maybe we could talk about like the class system in Mexico. Try to do this without getting in trouble. It'll be impossible to even capture correctly in a, you know, three minute soundbite. But maybe you could give us your perspective on kind of like the class system in Mexico, uh, how you're sort of how, how you see things. Let's see how to say it without getting in trouble. Yeah, I don't think that's possible. I mean, there's enough people that, you know, have woke ideologies and they think that, you know, they can uplift other social classes and things like that. The way that I view it is, hey, the social class has been in place since the Spanish got here. It's very unlikely that me as an individual is going to make any change to it. So I just have to accept it. So, of course, there are people that, are gonna be, you know, your your maids, your your wait staff, and things like that. You're just gonna have to hire them. Like if you want to live well, you're gonna have to hire them. I say that the apartment that I live in, I have, you know, three bedrooms, but it's got a fourth bedroom, third bath and shower that has a special, you know, door. The kitchen opens up and goes into a different area of the house, and it's specifically it's, if you it's had a maid quarters. Maid. Yeah. It's a maid quarters, so it's like. If your apartment has a maid's quarter, it's likely that, you know, you live in an area where people have always been well off. So the class system simply exists. You know, I'm, I'm not here to, to change it. I'm not going to say it's good or bad, but that is it is what it is. I mean, the people that I hang out with, you know, now are typically in the upper classes, even if they don't think they're in the upper classes. So occasionally they, they like, you know, do and say things or I'm like, yo, I don't think that would fly in America. Like, you know, you can't just, you know, dump your stuff on the ground and expect the the uh, the waiter to come in and pick it up. But they do sometimes, um, you know, they'll, they'll talk about people in certain ways where the average American would be like, oh, I don't think you should talk to people like that. But I'm like, hey, those people have been in this position for hundreds of years. Like some of my friends are essentially part of like a nepotism system where I just acknowledge, like, hey, that's how they've been since their great grandparents were in Mexico. Mm. And you can hear it in the background, the uh, Fiero Viejo. Yep. I've got a stove to get rid of. I guess I can toss it out the window. Uh, I want to come back to this, but speaking of noise, how do you find the noise where you are? Um. So I am just outside of the like the bubble area where I don't hear as much of the noise. But after a while, I think it just gets like you kind of drown it out. I know people say like, you know, Mexicans are the loudest country. 
and you know they just like tolerate noise but like if you didn't mention it i didn't even recognize it in the background it's just part of <laughs> the occasional noise at this point do you have trouble like sleeping where you are at all with where like you know neighboring buildings are having parties really late and stuff um not at all not at all like i said i've i've gotten used to it i think the crowning achievement was one day my neighbors came and told me that my party was too loud and i was like i know that i'm doing something right if mexican neighbors are like yo can you turn it down a little bit but i i really just think that it's something you just get used to after a while it doesn't really phase me plus i mean it's it's surprising i think it's just the microphone picks up the sounds a whole lot better because I'm on the the top floor of my building, so I'm not like ground level. I don't I actually don't hear it on my side as much. Was wasn't there some sort of tension with your neighbor? Um, just the just the downstairs one. It's like I live in a building that's got a lot of old people. Like they're old money Mexicans or something like that, or or like even some Spanish people, and you know they just. They're old, so of course they're going to have a little bit more complaints than other people. Or since I'm on the top, like let's say uh, there's an instance where I had my little like maid's room. I was like running some water or whatever, and it started overflowing. I didn't know about it, so it started dripping down over the balcony. And one of the neighbors came and knocked on my door and was like, hey, you know, you're getting my balcony all wet. And I'm like, my bad. I didn't think it was a, a big deal. <laughs> like some water going over the balcony shouldn't really phase you, but. I've never really had any like strong problems where they're like, I don't like that guy. <laughs> okay. I just figure he's old. Like he doesn't, he's, he's, he needs something to do. He, he's just old. Speaking of, do you think Mexico city is relatively family friendly? Could you see yourself raising a family in the city or would you have to go to some other part of like a different neighborhood or even a different city in Mexico to accomplish that? Um, I would say like, yes, it's family friendly. There's a lot of stuff to do, but then it, again, it comes down to money. I would say like, I've kind of looked into if I'm going to have a family here, where would I put them to school? And it's like, okay, I could find easily find, you know, some private schools or, you know, the, the uh, international schools and whatnot to put your kids in something like that could be, you know, maybe an extra 12 grand, 15 grand a year. That doesn't seem like a big fee to me, but you know, for the average person in the city, I can see that that would be a ridiculous amount to pay. So if you have the money, like, yeah, have your kids be in the city. There's there's great schools. They're going to interact with a lot of uh, like high level people at those schools, especially with all of the like both foreigners and just rich Mexicans in the city. But I'd say like on, on average, you know, if I was back in the States, I'd probably say like, no, I'm not paying, you know, 40 grand a year for kindergarten. So I definitely wouldn't want to live in a city in that case how do you how do you see raising a family might look different in mexico versus the u.s maybe in the sense that maybe you're able to not have a car walk the kids to school um maybe the activities look different have you what what do you think you would notice mm. I mean, I actually think they would probably be better off. I mean, I've also lived in a lot of small towns and simply the access to people that you would get by being in the city could possibly set your kids off for a much better like lifestyle in terms of them, you know, learning multiple languages. They wouldn't even have to learn Spanish and English. I mean, I've got friends that went to German schools that are in Mexico City, so they speak like fluent German along with English. Um, a lot of like business people are going to congregate in, you know, the Mexico cities or Monterrey area. So you're definitely going to meet people that it's like, you know, they're the, the, uh, the trust fund type kids of Mexico. And it's like, you know, I'm not, you know, trust fund status at this point, but why wouldn't you want to have your kids be inter- able to interact with those people for, you know, future business opportunities? I feel like if you look at most of the like wealthy people today, they typically often like know each other, have been in the same circles, went to the same schools. And that's where a lot of those opportunities come from. Like if you live out in the middle of, you know, nowhere out of Jalisco, you're likely not going to run into that kid that's possibly possibly going to be the next Bill Gates or something like that, because he's not going to live in that area either. His family's probably going to be a little bit well off to put them in a 
good school, good education, and down the road from there. Yeah, definitely makes sense. Have you heard of a school there called, uh, it's called like Ibero America, Ibero University? The, yeah, the university, yeah. I heard that this is like the top. We, we, we just had another podcast with uh, Antonio Lasso. Um, who, he lives in Colombia now, but he used to live in Mexico, and he was talking about this university called Ibero, which is um, somewhere around there in Polanco or something. And it's like where all the Frisas went to school and kind of met, and that's how they all know each other. Yeah, there's like, yeah, like Ibero Americano, and there's also like, uh, like Monterey Tech, or it'd be like Tecnología, mm-hmm. Tecnología de Monterrey, I guess, but like Monterey Tech. Yeah, those are some of like the best universities. I mean, I still consider like UNAM a good school. I don't, it's supposed to be, you know, the top Latin America school, but it's just not private. Right. Yeah. So I think there's like a private public distinction. And I think UNAM's the top, the top public and then Ibero's one of the top private, something like that. I don't know the Mexico either, City stuff super well. It's either... It's either there or like Monterey Tech. Yeah, Tech Monterey is good too. Um, okay, let's hit some other questions. Um, hey, here's out of oh, dude, helicopter deliveries, beauty <laughs> of SAS. Why does he, Mister Bowtie Passport, use helicopter deliveries instead of DocuSign? All right, that is that is hundred percent a joke that I had posted a video of a helicopter ride, and and made the joke that uh, like the client was just being too slow, so I decided to take the helicopter to, to have him sign the paperwork. But that's that's hundred percent a joke. I do not own a helicopter <laughs> yet. I like it. Yeah, I was like going to lunch, something like that. But I was like, what does that have to do with DocuSign? That's that's the sales sales thing. Ah. Now I can say, I can say I can almost fly a helicopter. I, I started taking lessons uh, to be a helicopter pilot, and then COVID hit, and then I was like, all right, I'm grounded, and then I moved to Mexico. So I never actually finished my helicopter flight lessons either. I kind of just gave up that. Yeah, I'm sure it's a bit expensive. Uh, so DocuSign, I guess the idea is for people in sales, tech sales, when you sign a deal. The, the client signs the DocuSign? Yeah, instead of having to be in person and write the contract and have it sign it manually, DocuSign mm-hmm. is just a tool where you upload the contract, you can put all the data inside it, create you know the boxes for signs, and the customer can do a digital signature. So, I mean, everybody in tech sales is going to be using DocuSign for everything. I mean, if you're, mm-hmm. if you're like extra cheap, maybe you're using like Google Docs to do a sign, but... Everybody's using DocuSign now. Okay. When I did tech sales, they just didn't sign anything. It was like an honor system, basically. I mean, we recorded the calls, so it was like a verbal agreement, but they weren't signing anything. So is that, this is more of a corporate thing? It was definitely a, a corporate thing. I mean, there's, there's so many. That's the, the kind of a, a negative of the corporate side of tech sales is when it comes to contracts, like, you know, you're going to draft the contract send it to the customer, the customer is going to send it to their legal team and their legal team might eat it up and want to change like minor issues back and forth. That part alone can sometimes takes, take weeks just to get them to look over a contract. They don't like one thing, they want to change it. Now you've got to go back to the drawing board. You got to get your lawyer side in, involved. Mm-hmm. That can be a hassle. Hey guys, quick break from the episode to tell you about BitRefill. BitRefill allows you to shop online and in person without banks, converting your crypto directly into merchant balance. We're talking gift cards to Nike, Amazon, Apple, Airbnb, Hotels.com, and many more, all paid for with crypto. BitRefill offers more than 10,000 gift card options in 180 countries all across Latin America, including Brazil, Colombia, Mexico, Argentina, El Salvador, and many more. You can also apply the code MyLatinLife at checkout to get 10% back on your first purchase. Go to bitrefill.com for more information. Hmm. Maybe we could talk about like corporate tech sales. I think you were mentioning to me offline that 
you're kind of getting bored of the corporate tech sales and maybe you wanted to do like B to C instead and do high ticket sales, something like that? Uh, like not necessarily high ticket sales, but the boredom part is definitely correct where I'm interested in just trying new things in general. So the background is this part is pretty much unheard of on uh, Twitter because I don't never talk about it. But while in the army, I started a consulting company. This is like the 2015, 16 area working with uh, crypto companies, anything that was on the blockchain, really kind of around that ICO area where there's almost no regulation. Everybody had a great idea, but horrible execution. So I took the military's essentially troop leading procedures and, and mission processes and use those exactly to do go to market strategies or to do business consulting. Uh, essentially, like a lot of officers also go into, you know, big four consulting. So the case studies aspect of like consulting is perfect for the military if you're doing like logistics and, and writing in the military. So I ran that company for a couple of years. It made a good bit of money up until government started asking questions. And when the IRS, FinCEN, SEC all has questions, we decided to just shut down the company, finish working with who we had as clients and, and walk away. And right around that time period, I'm not sure how, but uh, one of the things that reached out to me and said, like, hey, we're starting a segment. It's going to be around blockchain and startups, and we're looking for people that have experience and contacts in that area. So I didn't have formal tech experience, but I had had enough uh, paperwork to show that I know what I'm doing. And the company brought me in as a senior rep. I, I came in first kind of to help build the organization. I was like one of 10 people on their original team for the new headquarters. Um, I worked with them for a while and then I got poached by a pretty big startup. And that startup said like, hey, we'll pay you more, give you uh, you know, unlimited PTO, you can stay remote. And then I worked with them for a while. Um, I actually came to Latin America while I was working for this company remote, started kind of working with Latin American companies also, made a decent amount of contacts over on this side of the point where I left that company. And the, the, the FANG side for Mexico decided like, hey, we're not as regulated as in America, so we can bring you on to multiple projects. And I kind of had been, have been a, a consultant working back and forth with a lot of different startups in Mexico City and America also. But mm -hmm. I'd say as you get more senior in an organization, if you're an independent contributor, you have a team that still does a lot of your work. So, I mean, I've you know got teams of SDRs, the pre-sales people do a lot of the work where I say that I don't really do as much work. I just show up and kind of close the deal or show up and give the advice. So I'm looking to just branch and try new things. And one of my favorite people is uh, Daniel Day-Lewis. Are you familiar with him? The actor. The actor, yeah. He was, in, he was the butcher from Gangs of New York. He was in There Will Be Blood. And if you look at his movie history, he only does a movie like every seven years, something like that, where he'll read the role and then just start doing that odd job for years before coming to play the role. So he'll become a tanner, like making shoes from raw hide. He becomes a butcher for like, you know, four or five years. And that's kind of how I view life is like, I want to be, or I'm like kind of at the area where I can afford to just take a couple of years and play around with the completely new industry just for fun. Like that's how I got into like horses. I just enjoy horses and I kind of just, you know, I just want to be a rancher or something like that for a while and disconnect for a little bit. Mm. I can see how owning horses in Mexico is a lot more attainable than owning horses in the U S hundred percent. Yeah. <laughs> Way cheaper. I feel like you can get a horse for like, 500 bucks, 1,000 bucks in Mexico. Uh, I mean, horses, I would say, aren't cheap, cheaper in Mexico. I mean, you're not going to be paying $500, but I mean, in places where there's a big horse culture, I mean, there's still horses selling for a million dollars in Mexico. Uh, you know, you, yeah. you still can pay thirty, forty, fifty thousand dollars $50,000 for a horse easy. So, I mean, if you want a, a show horse or like a working horse, yeah, you can pay a lot of money. But if, if you're just like, yo, this is a kind of 
older retired horse, a couple thousand dollars can go a long way. I mean, when I go to little pueblos and like farming areas and you see like donkeys and goats and stuff like that, I'm like, how much does that cost? And the numbers are all always like insanely cheap. Like a couple hundred bucks for like a goat or a pig or something like that. For a, for a goat or a pig, yeah. But for a horse, I'd say there's they're not like crazy crazy cheap. I mean, like still a couple thousand dollars would be a good price for a decent horse. So how would that work? Like I'm I'm down for the horse lifestyle. I'm down to like, you know, I don't know, uh, hang out there and give my kids horse riding lessons and stuff like that. How do, how, how do you see that working out? Like, are you, you buy the horse and then you like rent space at a horse farm facility? Cause like obviously buying or renting your own facility, there's not too many of those to go around. So I guess you bring your horse to an existing facility or how does that work? In the States, people often do that, but in Mexico, I'd say the the cost is cheap if you're thinking about it as like a Western person, but the cost is still expensive from the Mexican standpoint. So everybody that I know that owns their own horses, they have, you know, a, a plot of land, a hacienda, you know, somewhere where, you know, they're not paying to rent a place to keep their horse. Like they just own everything outright. Sometimes they have, sometimes they have, you know, people working on their, their land and whatnot. I mean, it's it's the same with uh, like like planes. Like the average person has a plane, they probably just keep it to themselves. They're not, you know, renting the uh, facilities uh-huh. somewhere else in Mexico. But so there's a or, lot you know, of like having a having a living made. You know, you're not people that have a living made can afford those type of stuff. Sure, but I guess like it's not as simple as just buying a random piece of land. You have to build like you know barns and fences and all this type of stuff. Yeah, yeah, but again, the, the cost, the costs are only inexpensive from the Western standpoint. I mean, when you factor in, you know, the government's ratings for you know wages, where sixty-five percent of the country still makes less than you know two thousand or twenty thousand pesos a month, or like you know eleven hundred dollars a month, the average person's not going to be able to buy a horse or, or anything like that. What if we built like our own little community and we had like a horse farm thing and then we had like six, seven houses or something on the piece of land and then and everyone had like their own horse and we all like chipped in. I'm down for it. We we could buy it in like a Husco or something like that or, you know, outside of Guadalajara, we can buy a Uh big plot of land. I'm down for it. You know, we can overcharge, overcharge the, the foreigners to come ride horses and stuff like that make a whole experience. Yeah. I kind of, I, I got put into work. I went to the, like the Charo Lienzo, Charo de Jalisco, and I stayed there for a day and they just had me like cleaning the horses and all kinds of stuff. Cause nobody was around. That's what I want to do with, you know, some, a group of foreigners giving me experience of like, yo, you're going to be a farm hand for the day. I feel like they'd love that. So do you think you would have like a dedicated horse property or you'd have like some sort of working, farm working ranch that just so happens to have horses you know what i mean like you could have like a like a coffee farm or some other some other type of agricultural product and then just like you know throw down a few horses for you know to be useful or would you have like a dedicated horse property i'd probably have it more like a like a finca type thing or you just got like a a farmhouse it's not actively being farmed. It's kind of like the vacation place for the family to go out to. That's what I've seen, like, for the most part. People just have, you know, a, a farmhouse out in, like, the, the forest somewhere, something like that. And they've got horses there. And either okay. the horses are wild, like, I've seen the horses be wild, or I've seen, like, a family live on the, the property and pretty much do all the maintenance, and they pretty much get to, to live free as long as they take care of everything. That's what I've seen, like, more commonly. I mean, I don't have like big aspirations to have a, you know, a coffee farm or anything like that. I just want to relax. Okay. Just a couple acres. I like it. Okay. Um, we'll, we'll switch it up things. We, we only have a couple of minutes left, actually. Um, I think a, a common question here, one of the questions on Twitter um, 
which I think is a pretty common one and good for you to answer. The question is as follows. Being an, being an owner-operator truck driver, are there any blue-collar opportunities to carve a good living in Mexico or LATAM in general? No, no. So... <laughs> For any, I've, this, this is a question I've gotten asked on so many calls that I've had with guys where, you know, they have a job that is, you know, a skilled labor in America and they think that it will translate to Mexico. So I've talked to like plumbers, uh, people that were, have worked in construction or work in construction, even um, like people that are personal trainers, pretty much you have to, all of those jobs aren't going to pay you anything. In, in Mexico. Truck driver is not going to pay you anything in Mexico. You know, a skilled labor of a plumber, you know, if it's $40 an hour in the, in, a, in the States, it might be like $3 an hour in Mexico. I actually seen like a, an advertisement for like plumber apprenticeships and it was legit maybe $3 an hour. So if you're going to come to Latin America in general, if you're going to come to Mexico City, you have to have a job that you can do remotely and continue to make American dollars. There's, there should be no thought of you coming to Mexico and making pesos. Like if, if you want to make pesos, that's more of like a hobby. Like even teachers are not getting paid that much money. Teachers are getting paid maybe a thousand dollars a month. So, I mean, I've, I've met teachers here and it's, it's like hanging out with your broke friend where, you know, they, they can't go anywhere because they just don't have enough money. And it's like, yo, you're a foreigner in Mexico and you are living like the average population. I mean, I'm not saying that that's like a negative, but it's just not something that I or like anybody that I would want to hang out with should be striving to achieve. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you want to be a so, truck so, driver and make money, I guess you got to work for the cartel or something like that. <laughs> so what do we tell our truck driver friend to get into tech sales? I mean, I kind of hate the quote of, you know, like learn the code, get into tech sales, blah, 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 because if you're, you know, in the truck driver area, you're likely just not going to get spun up on tech stuff like that quickly. It's going to be a long path. So, I mean, you could take, you know, the multi-year path and try to break into tech sales. But I would say, like, you know, if you're the owner operator looking to being maybe just the owner, and if you're able to contract those uh, people out, like from Mexico in the States, go for that, where you can make the money, but not actually have to manage it in person. I mean, if you're, you know, owner operator and you're making decent money, maybe look into, you know, buying a couple properties, learn the property aspect of things, have your properties in the States and then live off of the income, you know, in, in Mexico. If you're in a, a blue collar area, like you, you need to be the owner that you can manage it outside of, you know, wherever you are at that exact moment. This episode of the My Latin Life podcast is brought to you in part by Job Stacking. Introducing Rolf Holtz's Paycheck Multiplication Layering Method, a revolutionary approach that redefines the traditional career path. This is Rolf's new Done With You program where he'll work with you to implement job stacking for yourself. With this method, Rolf contractually guarantees that you'll be able to double your income in 45 days. So, are you ready to step out of the shadows of job insecurity and step into a world of career abundance? Then just click the link in the description of this episode, book a call with Rolf, and start walking the path of unleashing your earning potential with job stacking. Yeah, yeah, I'd agree with that. So that's probably one of the most common questions you get, I guess, right? Is like people think the lifestyle... Sounds very appealing, you know, low cost of living, more fun, blah, blah, blah. But they just, they got to take care of that income piece to make it happen. Yeah, that the income is the first thing that you got to work on. I Definitely. think there was actually a question from, uh, from Bowtide Fox. He had some great questions. Uh, all right, queuing up your own questions, go for it. <laughs> Hit it. I gotta click click my page real quick and scroll. Let's see if I can find it. By the way, when we wrap up, um, give it a second so that the, the audio is time to upload in the browser. Ah, yeah. So Fox's questions were around like, you know, fresh farmers where you can find produce, milk, beef. 
things like that. I think that's like a, a, a interesting topic question that maybe somebody like way more experienced than me will get into at some point. But there's like this this dream or you know idea that the food in Latin America is going to be like much more healthier. You know, the fruits and vegetables are going to be much more healthier. But I say that like you're going to have them in season longer. But I personally don't think that the stuff is going to be more healthier. If you look at um, say like NAFTA, NAFTA pushed really hard to get Mexican farmers to use more fertilizers and pesticides and stuff like that. And I mean, like a place like Mexico City with 9 million people within the city, you know, 23 million people within the, the metro area, there's just not enough ways to have like sustainable farming and things like that within a population this big. So you have to accept that people are using fertilizers and pesticides and whatnot to grow. You know, there's probably some genetically mutated stuff in there also. I, I think I what I would like say the, is it's fresher. It's like maybe, fresher. It, it's like fresher. Maybe they're still using pesticides frozen. or whatever. Like it's kind of hard to avoid that without going to Europe maybe, but it's going to be fresher. Yeah, it's going to be, like I said, it'll be fresher in season. It's coming, quote, like local. It's not being shipped internationally, but it's if you're – if your big worry is like, you know, oh, I'm going to die from seed oils or like, oh, I'm going to get cancer from pesticides. Like you just have to grow all that stuff yourself if you really think that anywhere is going to actually have like non-GMO everything. Like the GMO and whatnot, they've embedded everywhere in Latin America. And I guess I would also say go to the market and not the grocery store. Even even the markets. I mean, they're they're just not usually growing big enough yields that they're going to be using some, you know, tricks. Not sure, to, but it's fresher there. Stuff, it's like it's trucked fresher, right yeah. in from the from the farms and stuff. Yeah, yeah. His other question he had was like, um, do you need any physical investments like a water filter or anything like that? I, I think that's a hilarious question. I'm not sure if he was like half trolling or not, but you can drink the water in Mexico. I mean, you, you have maybe not, you know, straight from a pond or out of your faucet, but there's not any issue where you need some special infrastructure to survive in Latin America. If you've got enough money, everything is going to be catered to you. Like there's, there's more amenities here, I would argue, than what the average person is going to find in United mm -hmm. States, England and stuff like that. It's because of one, the cost to acquire it. You're going to be able to get it a whole lot cheaper and easier that you're never going to have any of those issues. And what do you mean the amenities are better? Let's say, uh, <laughs> I know you've got one also, but you know, a house cleaner. So, you know, you can hire a house cleaner to come and clean your stuff up for a couple hundred pesos. Um, you can have a chef come to your house and cook. So regularly I'll have like a house cleaner. Regularly I'll have somebody come and, you know, cook or, you know, buy the groceries for me and do all the cooking. Um, if you need a driver, it's it's much easier to get a driver, like much more cost effective to say like, hey, I want to go to Puebla or something like that. And I don't want to take the bus. I don't want to take an Uber either. You can hire a driver. So amenities and, and those th things that are typically reserved for like the the rich, I would say, in America are very accessible to even the like middle class, upper middle class. And I say the rich because even if you're high income, like the cost of a house cleaner and you know, New York or, or DC, like you're going to still gonna be paying 80, hundred dollars plus for, you know, a person to come and clean a one to two bedroom uh, apartment or like two bedroom house in Mexico city. Like it's expensive to pay $5 an hour for, for hired help. I would agree with that. Mm, much better lifestyle in a lot of ways, Latin America, um, higher level of service and stuff for sure. Uh, that's all we have time for today, Mr. Bowtie Passport. Great, great. I, I intentionally left off a bunch of stuff, hoping people, I guess, request that I hop on again. But I've still got plans yeah. to visit you, so we'll end the call and I'll hop on a, a 6 a.m. plane and I'll, I'll be at your house pretty soon. <laughs> You take the bus, man. Um, we'll also do a, a Mexico roundtable episode at some point. So we'll get you on with uh, all the other esteemed Mexico enthusiasts. Uh, do you want to take this time and share any kind of message or, or last words with the audience? 
Uh, I guess I'd just say, you know, the typical shout out of go to my Instagram, or not Instagram, I go to my Twitter page, go to my Substack and follow, slide in my DMs. I'll help out as many people as possible and have fun. Awesome. Twitter, Substack, DMs will all be linked up in the show notes. This has been another episode of the My Latin Life Podcast. Again, my guest today, Bowtied Passport. Thanks to Mr. Passport and thank you to the audience for listening.